From the newsrooms of the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, this is Please Explain. I'm Samantha Selinger Morris. It's Thursday, December 21st. We've been bystanders to the saga of the Bruce Lehrman and Brittany Higgins case for nearly three years now. And if one thing has defined the devastating set of lawsuits, it's been a lack of definitive answers about allegations that have been explosive about whether a rape occurred in the office of then-Defense Industry Minister Linda Reynolds in the early hours of Saturday, March 23rd, in 2019. And whether the government at the time, then led by former Prime Minister Scott Morrison, orchestrated a cover-up of the alleged crime. Bruce Lehrman has always strenuously denied raping Brittany Higgins, insisting that the pair had no sexual contact at all. A criminal trial last year was aborted due to juror misconduct and subsequent proceedings and the charge against Lehrman were later dropped out of concern for Higgins' mental health. Today, associate editor and special writer Deborah Snow on what this case, which has enthralled so many of us, has exposed about the political cultures and institutions that it has also put on trial. So, Deb, you've been following this trial closely, and I think it's fair to say it's lifted the lid on the inner workings of certain political cultures and social institutions that people don't ordinarily get a look in on. So I'd like to start with the media. It's arguably been put on trial here, too. So can you take me through that a little and whether perhaps this has been a good thing that the inner workings of the media have been exposed here? Yeah, so this was essentially a trial almost in two parts. There was the the rape allegation, of course, and then there's the question of how well did the media, in this case Network 10, do the due diligence on the story. A smiling Bruce Lerriman on the way to watch his barrister pick apart the story that earned Lisa Wilkinson a logie. The journalist taken to task over her explanation... So what the the media witnesses have had to justify is the decisions they made, uh, the choices they made about who to approach and when they approach them. Wilkinson rejected accusations. She failed to give Lerriman enough time to respond to the rape allegations, claiming 80 hours before broadcast was fair and reasonable. A journalist of four decades... Did they push back on aspects of... Brittany Higgins allegations, not so much the rape allegation, but also the allegation that she felt she'd been pressured not to go public, not to go to the police, that her career was at stake. The TV host also grilled about a text sent to producer Angus Llewellyn while watching with Higgins' former boss, the Defence Minister, in question time, Reynolds lying through her teeth, denying she lost objectivity and only believed Brittany. Ms. Wilkinson for journalists watching, and certainly for me, I've been asking myself, well, what would I have done in that situation if that had been me? When would I have contacted Bruce Lerman or made sure his email was correct or who would I have gone to for that information? So one of the things that Lerman's counsel has raised is that he was a young man of 23. Was it really adequate notice for him to be approached on a Friday afternoon, middle of a Friday afternoon, with the program going to air the following Monday evening? How was he going to find a lawyer in that time? Where was he going to go for expert advice? You know, what was that a reasonable length of time? Now, the producer, Derek Llewellyn, and the project host, Lisa Wilkinson, and the executive producer all have said that they felt that was plenty of time to give to both Lehrman and the government staffers and ministers they approached. It'd be interesting to see whether the judge agrees with that. And so do you think it was perhaps an uncomfortable experience for journalists and other media professionals who are watching? I think there, there is a, an understandable desire to protect your exclusive story when you have one. And we all have that instinct. It's drummed into us by the business, which is highly competitive. And your commercial model, to some extent, depends on having a reasonable number of exclusive stories, you know, that readers or viewers have to come to you if they want that story because no one else has got it. So you're constantly trying to put guardrails around that, make sure you protect it. Part of that is then striking a balance between when do you go outside the tight circle of people you've been consulting about it to try and do your external checks? How late or early do you do that? And it's a constant tension in the business. And to some degree, I have some sympathy with the project witnesses about the choices they made. But when you look at them in the cold, hard light of a courtroom, they do come into a different light. And so, yes, I think we've all been 
I suspect myself, other journalists watching this have probably put ourselves in their shoes and gone, well, what would we have done? Okay, and I wanted to ask you about how this trial's also exposed what you've so expertly termed in one of your columns, the whiff of the Hunger Games atmosphere in the office of Linda Reynolds in 2019. This was, of course, just weeks before the federal election. So what has this trial exposed with regard to just how competitive and stressful a ministerial office can be? Look, I think in an ordinary course of events, I've worked in a ministerial office. It shouldn't be super competitive within the office, but this was a fairly unique and unusual time and situation. So as you rightly said, it was just weeks away from an election. There'd been a sudden resignation of the then Defence Industry Minister, Steve Chobo. His job had had to go to someone else. Scott Morrison chose to promote Linda Reynolds from her relatively junior portfolio of Assistant Minister for Home Affairs into the Defence Industry portfolio. That meant that her office would expand. She'd have to take on more staffers and not all of whom were known well to each other and all of them knowing that some of them were likely to lose their jobs after the election and even if they won, which no one really thought was going to happen, there'd still be a bit of a jostle for places. So it was just a fairly unique set of circumstances around that particular office and the way it had come together so rapidly in the, the, the few weeks before the election. And Brittany Higgins was the most junior member of the office and she was clearly trying to make sure, you know, that she had somewhere that she would have a berth after the election. This was one of the reasons she was out socialising that night with a group of defence industry people. She, she was trying to shore up her networks and she was not enjoying, it seems, being in the same office as Lerman. They'd only been together in the office about three weeks because she believed that he was treating her as his personal secretary, I think, were the words she used, and getting her to do menial jobs. And she really wanted to prove herself. She wanted to be seen as a serious staff member rising up the ranks. And there was a degree of jostling about who was going to get which position. But as I say, it was very much an unusual situation. Uh, There was a sense, I think, in the the dying days of the Morrison government that, you know, it's the last days of Rome sort of thing. (laughs) the empire crumbling and that would sort of tend to fuel what I call the the Hunger Games atmosphere in that particular office. So Deb, I'd like to turn to another political debate that this trial has arguably exposed, which is a discussion about the Morrison government, specifically about whether there was a cover-up by the government of this alleged crime or not. So can you walk me through this a little? Yeah, well, when the project story went to air. So Lisa Wilkinson interviewed Brittany Higgins and it went to air on the 15th of February, 2021. And they introduced the story by saying, yeah, this is a story of a young woman basically forced to choose between justice and her career. So that was how it was framed. And when the story first came to them, they saw it as having explosive political potential to quote a message between Lisa Wilkinson and the producer. So it was framed as she was uh, put in a position where she had to make a choice. They were going to an election. Uh, This was going to be an embarrassment. She had to be a team player. And that meant not getting justice for the alleged rape. And so the cover up story became Morrison government was doing everything it could to suppress this in a pre-election atmosphere. And Brittany herself appears to have believed this. And and as I say, she was a young woman. She was 24. She was obviously feeling very uh, insecure, frightened. She'd only been in Canberra a few months. You could understand how she might form the view that there were forces working against her. But Fiona Brown, who was the Chief of Staff to Senator Reynolds at the time, absolutely denied there was a cover-up. She's given testimony saying, in fact, she was being told by Senator Reynolds and another minister that they should go to the police. And she felt that uh, it was Brittany's decision to do that. There was a lot of interpretation, misinterpretation, cues being read one way, cues being read another way. But as I said, the evidence for cover-up, I won't say it's been completely blown out of the water, but there's been... No evidence for that that's emerged from this trial. If anything, it's, it's gone the other way.
And I wanted to turn now to the fact that this trial has been live streamed the entire time. You've written that on some days there have been more than 100,000 daily page views, which I find really interesting. So what does that say about us, if anything? Well, I think it says it was a very hot topic. You know, it was subject of a massive exclusive for 10 when the story went to air. Certainly played into the the politics at the time. It fed very much into a narrative around the the Morrison government's tin ear when it came to dealing with women. It's just been constantly in the public eye. So, of course, given that the judge decided to live stream it, naturally enough, there was massive public interest in it. And I wanted to ask you about that judge deciding to live stream it. Can you take us a bit through why the judge did decide this? The federal court, I'm told by barristers, prides itself on open justice and transparency. And the judge, Judge Michael Lee, would often stress through the case that he wanted transparency as much as possible. He didn't want counsel sending him things to his chambers. He wanted everything playing out in open court. It's been good to see all this tested and questioned. And, you know, for people who wanted to really feel that this had been thoroughly examined, the trial has been um, educative and elucidating. It's obviously been gut-wrenching at times, especially watching Brittany Higgins have to recount yet again uh, the details of the way she alleges she was assaulted. So we mustn't forget that this has been horrendous experience. I mean, that's an excellent point, and it, it makes me wonder, what do you think the follow-on impacts of the live streaming could be? Because you quote a media lawyer saying that it could give potential litigants pause for thought. Well, this is not the first live stream. At one point, just out of idle curiosity, I I flicked over while watching the case. There was a short adjournment. I I flicked over and there was a Qantas case running in another one of the federal courts. And I think that the viewer total was 132 people. Uh, Contrasting that with the 20 to 30,000 tuning in when it was Lisa Wilkinson or you know, another high profile witness. So look, with media defamation trials where there's a high profile complainant, this trend is likely to continue where there will be a lot of public interest and judges will make calls as to whether or not they want to live stream. And if they do, again, if it's a high profile complainant, there is quite likely to be a very high audience. And, and, And that person would have to, I guess, think very carefully about how am I going to go in what's essentially a live performance space. Some people will be confident that they can hold their own in that forum and others might think twice about it. Deb, it's been an absolute pleasure hearing your insights into this, this trial, which we've all been watching for so long. So thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. Thanks, Sam. Today's episode of Please Explain was produced by Tammy Mills with technical assistance by Chi Wong. Our executive producer is Ruby Schwartz. This is my last episode of the year, and I want to thank you all for listening. It's been a real privilege and a pleasure to explore these stories with you. I'll be back on January 16th with new episodes that will hopefully help us all understand the world we live in just a little bit better. Meanwhile, over the next couple of weeks, we'll be playing some of the best episodes from this year. We'll be airing fresh episodes from January 8th. Please Explain is a production of The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald. If you enjoy the show and want more of our journalism, Subscribe to our newspapers today. It's the best way to support what we do. Search The Age or smh.com.au forward slash subscribe. I'm Samantha Selinger Morris. This is Please Explain. Thanks for listening. See you next year.